actually launched in France, uh, a couple other countries here in Europe recently, uh, Benelux, Switzerland, Germany, I think, were the other ones. Uh, so hopefully some of you have actually seen it. Um, I've heard several people tell me that their productivity is off oh, the phone. <laughs> that would help. Can you hear me now? Uh, I know some people told me their productivity has dropped since we launched here. So that's actually kind of a good thing as far as I'm concerned. I want to talk about uh, the team that I'm on at Netflix. We're actually using Scala. Um, and I want to talk about how we're using that. So this is not a wide range in how everyone at Netflix is using Scala. Um, just really my team would give you an idea of what we're doing, some of the problems that we're trying to solve. I'm going to actually be giving a more detailed talk tomorrow on how to use some of these tools to build applications like this yourself as well. And that, that's it at 10 o'clock. So the first question is, is what my team does. What are we using Scala for? And a lot of that breaks down to being APIs. We're building REST services that do domain logic and other things uh, in order to collect information. And then there's a UI, which another part of our team builds using AngularJS. So a big part of it is that we're really half of an application. It's not a full application because there is a UI on top of that. And that affects some of how we have to do things just as much as hey, we've got these REST endpoints, and what are we doing? Uh, and this is really fundamentally built with Scalatra and Swagger. Swagger is a huge part of what we're doing because of how it lets us document these APIs and make it easier for people to integrate. So this is a, a quick look at the website for Scalatra. Scalatra is really a micro framework for building web services, you know, well, not just web services, but websites in Scala. There are many other systems that work similar. Um, Scalatra works nicely, though, for what we're doing. The biggest part is that it's got built-in integration for Swagger. It's the, a lot of people who develop Scalatra are also developing Swagger, so everything's played really nicely together. What we do is fundamentally we're collecting knowledge. And this is information about devices that run Netflix. This is before public release. So as people are building devices that are going to run Netflix, we collect that information so that we know what they're building, how it works, what it supports. So these are things like display capabilities. There are these fancy 4K TVs out there now. Well, we'd like to know whether this TV supports 4K so that ultimately somebody can decide whether to show 4K content when you load up Netflix. The same thing goes for 3D. I bought a 3D TV earlier this year, and it's like, oh, there's this whole 3D category that I've never seen before. There's also remote control. There are things like, is there a dedicated Netflix button? One of the questions is even if you push the Netflix button when the TV's turned off, does the TV turn on? So all of this information is, is collected as part of the system. There's a lot of other metadata that's valuable, sometimes only to us internally, and sometimes to how the system works. We use this pretty widely internally. There's lots of different groups that can collect and utilize this information. So we've got a certification team that uses this to run tests. What features do we need to test? What things do we know aren't going to work correctly? What things do people ask to be exempt from? A UI as well. You know, if, if we're pushing a UI and we know this device has limited memory and limited CPU, we have to make decisions about what to show. And so the UI teams can help determine that based on this. And even support. You can imagine having a database of what devices do what and what they support can make it easier for someone supporting the product to make good decisions. So why do we like Scala? And you know, this is particular to our team, and there's lots and lots of reasons to like Scala. Um, most of Netflix is a Java shop. There's a lot of Groovy. There's some Node.js creeping in. And so obviously, like Scala, being Scala within a group that's mostly Java can be not a choice. But the biggest thing that we hopefully all know is it's concise but expressive. There's lots of things we can do that we can't necessarily do in Java. And despite the fact that usually people now start yelling, but Java has lambdas now. I mean, we have more than just lambdas. And then a big part of it, too, is we have the object-oriented stuff, which for some of it is just that when we're leveraging libraries from other parts of the company, having object-oriented, good object-oriented support means we can extend these classes, we can interact with them, but then we get all of the functional programming. And we take a lot of advantage of that with all of the information we're collecting and how we're breaking that down. 
It's called it stays crunchy in milk. I don't know if you knew that. It's very, very important. The soggy cereal, never a good thing. We need the right tools for what we're doing. And as I said, I mean, Netflix is, there's a lot of job within the organization. There's also a lot of group. And the fact that Scala runs on top of the JVM and plays nicely on the JVM and even plays nicely with Java both ways has meant that all of these other tools at Netflix, we're not that group that's driving the ops team nuts because we're running something that doesn't play with everything else. We run on the JVM container, we can use the J2E containers that are still there, we can use the libraries. And we can reuse the code that's already there. So part of what my team has been doing is updating and, and, and moving over from a Groovy system, where we're slowly but surely moving that over. And there's parts of the application that can continue to play, even though it's halfway there. There's also, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of libraries for what we're doing. And it's important that we integrate with these things. Because like I said, you don't want to be that one team that everyone's going, what are they doing over there? Because it doesn't work with anything else that we're doing. And so there's a lot of stuff at Netflix. I mean, there's a lot of open source things that some of you may have seen. Um, but this includes you know, production containers to inject stuff, health checks, all of the other monitoring that we need in order to know what's happening and how it's working. And so Scalatra actually deploys into that J2E infrastructure quite nicely. We can just deploy it as a, you know, as a J2E jar, as a war file throw it out there and let it go. And uh, you know, the whole sort of Netflix infrastructure is running on a Gradle build. So we were able to splice that in. So although we're using SPT within our group, there's a Gradle file that's able to run this within the wider build for the CI system, et cetera, and have all of this integrate. So Swagger is a pretty big piece of what is being done. Obviously, they have a fancy new website. Swagger just did a 2.0 release. And what Swagger is, is a documentation system for doing REST APIs, for collecting information about what the API does, giving documentation, but also letting you interact with it so that you can play with these APIs in person. The biggest thing is that it makes API development a lot easier. And this is mostly from the standpoint of I have to hand this API to a JavaScript developer or a UI developer and say, hey, I need you to go build this thing. And normally it would be going back and forth, a lot of hand holding, oh, no, no, you need to send us this JSON object, it needs to look like this. Oh, that error message means this, that error message means that. With Swagger, all of that is documented. So part of our process as we write our Scalatra code has been that it's all integrated so that when you write an endpoint, you write the Scalatra, I'm sorry, the Swagger descriptors. And those Swagger descriptors generate this UI. So the UI team can just go, I can say, hey, there's this new endpoint at um, movies slash foobar. And they can pull that up and see, oh, well, I need this input. I get this output. And they can work with that slowly so that there's less of that back and forth just to understand what it is that we can do that because we have this other group of developers. And so they get all of this nice interactive documentation. What's cool as well is that you can actually post to it. You can submit things through that interface and explore what the responses look like. Swagger is built really around self-documenting code. And this is documentation that as long as you write your code, keeping in mind that you're tying everything to Swagger, is always up to date. And in many ways, like the Swagger integration for Scalatra will throw errors in certain cases if things that it expects need to be there aren't there. So there is a module for describing the API. It generates JSON. And then there's a UI, which is built in JavaScript, that you can connect to any um, Swagger or JSON output. And it will build the UI for you so you can interact with these things. And that Swagger JSON descriptor will point you at all the different places that you need to be. So this is a, I don't know how well that displays the back of the room. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of one of our services with Swagger where, wow, that really is even pixelated up here. I apologize. Um, 
This is for a service though called device model services. And so it's broken down by color. We've got a couple of get services, puts, and deletes. Where it's, so now it's clear, as long as we're following these rest verbs, then I know, oh, a put is probably an edit, a delete is remove an item, and a get is get information about an item. So I can quickly figure out which service is going to roughly give me what I need. But there's also a description that goes with each of these. And this is all part of that generated swagger information. And everything breaks down. And then there's you know, more information as we expand this out. Now this is a simple service that I pulled out for a test account. This interacts with another API that lets you create test accounts within our system. So we start a function where it's get. So we're specifying that we're writing a get method here, rather than a put or a delete or a post. The path, in this case, is slash. This is mounted within a larger service that has a base path to it, so that within that we're just saying we're getting slash. And then operation, this is the part where we actually feed in the rest of the slash information. So we need to point at this get test accounts method, which describes what this service does and what it is that we're going to be doing. And then we can go through the rest that we need. Um, with authenticated user is essentially a loan pattern. Within that with authenticated user method, it's looking for a specific cookie that indicates that whoever's calling the service has logged in, has the correct authentication information, and can go forward. If they don't, then the appropriate error codes are sent by the HTTP service and everything is kicked back. If they do, then we move forward providing an instance of auth user. And then I can just make a call to a test account manager, find the user that I'm looking for, and respond with an OK. And obviously, Scalatra has all these verbs to simplify the HTTP response. Similar things in play and spray and other things. Now, this is where everything for Scalatra is sort of stuck together. Get test accounts is a method that then is using an API operation. And the type argument here is the instance of the class that's going to be, I'm sorry, the type of class it's going to be responded by. Scalatra uses JSON for S integration. It does a lot of uh, automatic conversion for case classes. So you can convert from a case class to and from JSON, which simplifies a lot of what we can do. As long as we provide a case class, then we can handle this conversion within Scalatra without having to worry about deserializing everything manually. So this is going to spit out documentation. The base swagger method is actually API operation. Auth API operation is an additional piece that we wrote that adds some extra information so you can put a cookie token into your call. Um, so we extended some of our swagger information to make our lives easier. And again, that's how readable is that from the back of the room? It's not readable from the front. So Oh, okay. It's not readable from here either. I'm trying to think how to fix that problem. Um, I'm like, if I can't read, I wonder how it looks. It looked perfectly fine on my laptop screen. So can everybody just look at the monitor that's here on the bottom? Um, this is, is meant to be a quick glance at an individual endpoint for, um, let's see if I can do something with the resolution. Screen. One moment. 
Any better? It looks a little more readable to me. Okay. So this is actually to move down again, I apologize. That looks more correct. I just didn't hit confirm, you're correct. That was the issue. Uh, a little further, a little bit more. I think we're just missing the top of the slide now. That's what it is on the TV here. Is it? Okay. Oh, yeah, no, that's good. That's perfect. Yay. Excellent. Thank you. So we document our return type. We get the info back. Sort of thing is broken down, which is a lot easier for me to describe to someone exactly what I'm returning. But this is all just based on the case class that I've provided. Standard Scala case class. I don't have to decorate it with anything or any special type of trait. There's an additional button as well, where if you hit model schema, you get some breakdown of, well, what would this look like in more detail cases? For some reason, longs are quoted, which I'm not sure about that. So if I want to create a test account, and this goes into post, obviously it's a, you know, there's a little more that comes into play. Um, we have more parameters, but there's also now this with valid JSON body. And this comes back to the same idea of breaking down the case classes. So this method is going to say, hey, in order for this to continue, the body of the request has to contain a JSON object, which we can parse into this case class. And if we can't, then we can respond with a client bad request error. And then we, you know, we simply call in a create account for user. But what's changed here is that we've actually added a parameter. 
So we're specifying that the body parameter has to be defined of this case class with a description that ties down to, hey, this is what it is. And the description isn't for the, obviously isn't for the compiler or the computer here, but rather it's for whoever's reading this. This is the description of what the body needs to be. Um, and I apologize for the weird formatting, I was just getting it in on the slide. So the case of a more complex method, we actually can add a bunch of additional parameter information. We have body parameters, path parameters, query parameters, header parameters, so any kind of parameter you can input. Now in this case, you do not have to document these things for Swagger. It's not going to fail because you didn't document something. And this comes down to the question of am I providing the right information to whoever's calling the service? Without these, though, that sort of interactive part of Swagger won't work because it won't know these fields. Uh, there's also some nice improvements in Swagger 2.0, which I haven't been able to explore as much as I'd like, which includes things like being able to um, document all of the response codes. So rather than somebody coming to me and say, hey, I got this 418 error, which by the way is HTTP in a teapot, um, I got this obscure error, what does it mean? You can go through and document this HTTP code means this, this HTTP code means that, so that you get a full rundown within this Swagger documentation of what these different pieces of information are useful for. So here, you know, here's a rough look. This, as I said, we have this additional authentication information because you can specify a token. We're starting to move over to some cookie-based stuff, but this is useful for these things. So this test account request, well now here's this description. The request includes the Netflix test account, the origin, the email address, the password, the user's first name, and then the data type. So whereas before we showed this is the response type. This is the information that comes back as a response from the service. This is the same type of thing, but this is the body that you need to provide. And so you can get your model of, oh, you need to provide me these fields. Um, I believe I left off an optional example, but if you provide your case class, so let's say that first name was an option of string in my case class, it will be annotated here as well as optional. And so then you can just leave that off in the JSON request. So all of those little bits and pieces, what's nice is that the Scalatra integration will just kick those out in a way that makes sense to a UI developer. And then you know, the same thing where if we hit model schema, we will get a more JSON appropriate schema that runs us down what we need to do. So I want to seg a little bit because we're, you know, we're sort of talking about how we're using Scala and the different things that we're doing. And this probably of all the things when I joined Netflix in February has been the thing that I like the most. It's the closest to an ideal environment for me deployment-wise of, of all of the broken environments I've dealt with in my career, all of the different things I had to chase, especially because I was usually the guy who knew both the systems, you know, the administration and the development. Somehow I was always fixing other people's problems. So the traditional software deployment model, at least with you know, JVM development, is we deploy war files to Tomcat, Jenny, or whatever little crafty and hard that you've crafted for your web server needs. And there have been many of them. This was not one of the ponies that was added today for the record. That one's been there for a while. Apparently very expensive. You can buy that, but it was like a limited run. So if you have software changes, the way that we typically have done things is we have this server that someone set up for us years ago. And by the way, they're long gone and never documented what they did. And we may or may not apply security patches to that server because when we do our version of Python breaks and we don't know how to fix it, we've all hopefully, or hopefully none of you have been through that, but I'm going to guess that most of you have. So we just redeploy whatever we have to the same server. Now, this is the one that always is the most painful when I've done stuff like this. What happens if your release goes bad? No, it's a little bit easier with something like the JVM with the server where it's a war file. But what if we upgrade our HTTP container? What if we change some underlying piece? How do we fix this? It's not straightforward. And the even that better is chasing dependency conflicts. I know you're all smiling at the thought of chasing dependency conflicts because it's everybody's favorite thing. 
<laughs> the biggest part, though, I think, is reproducibility. If the server changes, how do I know that it's changed? Because I've run into these kinds of issues where somebody changed it six months ago, nobody knew, and it only blew up on us, oh, six months later when we were trying to do something. And inevitably, that person is on vacation or has quit. Uh, you can never get a hold of them. So you, I've got to ask questions. Did the new build break? Or was it something else on the server that broke? So maybe the code is fine, but suddenly you've got some interaction between a library that updated last night. Did somebody mess with the software? Oh, well, I really, really, really want Java 8. I'm not sure why I want Java 8 but it's the latest and greatest version, so I went ahead and installed it. And that that's kind of stuff happens. Um, even worse, you may have some kind of gibbering horror invading your servers. I mean, all the little things that can go wrong, because our servers tend to be mutable. They tend to be something that we can change and mess with. And when you give software developers and our dear friends in the systems administration groups access to things that they can muck with, what do they do? They muck with them. We like playing with things. So it turns out there's a better way. And obviously, this is not something that anyone at Netflix invented as you know, the, the latest, greatest idea. It's been around for a while. But this, as far as I've seen, is the hard and fast rule for how all deployments happen within the organization. Everything is immutable, which all the scholar developers in the room should go, hey, I know what immutability is. <laughs> as opposed to other conferences I've spoken at where I say immutable and glassy-eyed stairs, and I have to explain immutability. So we build server images as immutable AMIs, because everything is deployed on the Amazon Cloud. So there's these sort of pre-baked base templates that have the JQE container, they have all the libraries and everything else. And then our software build is rolled on top of that, and AMI that represents this build is baked. And that's immutable. You can't change that unless you push a new build through which makes a new AMI. So once it's deployed, it's never modified. Now I'm sure there's, actually I know there's people within the organization who have root passwords and can log in and detect things. I, I don't think I've ever actually logged into any of these production servers directly. We use log files and all these other things, or we just roll back to a previous known good build. And that's what's really great about it, because every release is baked as an AMI. I don't even have to say, well, where's the old jar file? I have an actual Amazon image that I can boot up and is ready to go and can't be changed. Oh, this was also a pony that was not added. For the record. So building an image, this is the great part, requires a valid Jenkins build. And this is part of that whole CI process that really makes immutability wonderful, which is that only Jenkins can merge to master. I actually forgot about this last night. I had rechecked everything out before I left um, on my personal laptop, and I went to do a check-in, and everything. I did several check-ins, and I went to push. Why am I getting this error message? Because I was not allowed to push to master. So everything goes into a dev branch, the way that our process works. And from that dev branch, Jenkins builds a CI build, runs our full test suite, which takes a while now because we've got lots of tests, which is a good thing. And once that build succeeds, Jenkins patches those changes into master. And then master can be fed out to a production release. So this follows a little bit of the sort of Git flow, which is a pattern that people have pushed around. But it's, it turns out to be really important that you can't just stick things in master. To get things in master, because master is allowed to go to production, they have to go through a test process. And there's no easy way to circumvent that unless you happen to have the admin rights on this repository, which most of the developers don't. And as far as I know, I've never actually seen my manager push things through, too. He's the biggest person on testing. So that helps quite a bit. Good testing is hugely important for this, though. Immutability is great, but things can't change is not really useful if we don't know what happens when we put information through them. And we have lots of tools to manage server images. Some of these are open source. There are some new tools internally coming along, and I'm not sure what the open source status of those is going to be. But everything is web interfaces and other things to make it very easy 
for us to do deployments. So I don't have to call someone or email someone to say, hey, I need this bill rolled out to the production systems. Our, our teams are empowered to do that. So if we have a working build, we can make that decision to push things out and have everything easy to roll. So this is a look at a, a, an internal tool called Namir, which I believe is being replaced. And it's my favorite because it's the only Muppet themed server that I think we have, if you can see Peter up at the top corner. Uh, and this, this represents actually, and this is a, a snapshot from I think May or April. But if you, you know, and again, I think this is an image. Can you see this from the front row? Sort of. So I'll describe it and I'll paint a mental picture and you can all imagine what you're looking at here. Um, but really what it is, is, is at the top we have the latest build. And this is the Jenkins job. So this is what particular job within Jenkins has been used to feed this. The build number, the build time, and whether it passed or failed. So the latest build will show up here even if it failed for us to know that this is what has occurred. And then there are two subsections. There's dev and staging, which is in this box that's probably very blurry to anyone beyond the first row. Um, and then there's production. And in each of these, you'll see there's an, an active server group name, the build number. So this is the Jenkins build number that represents this. And there's red or green. So there are always two active server groups available for each environment. The one that's red is the one that's no longer active, but that's the last build. So presumably we knew that build worked. And then the green one is the one we're running. So if we have a failure, we can very quickly with these tools say, hey, I want to flip that old build back on. And so they're archived and ready to go when we need to move forward. Uh, and we can you know, create a bunch. And we just started to split stuff out. So I think our, we created another dev group so that we weren't just pushing everything to dev and staging and treating them like the same environment. But this, you know, tools like this make it really easy. And I haven't gotten to play with the new ones yet, but apparently they made bigger and better things. But none of them are Muppet themed, which makes me very sad. So Asgard is a big one, and that is open source. I think it's written in Grails, and I've heard rumors of Asgard 2.0, but that might be rolled into the new tools they've built. This actually is lots of stuff for managing Amazon services. So I can get to real simple database service, Cassandra information, everything that I need that might be deployed within my stack in one place. The servers, as I said, are grouped into clusters. So that everything is tied together as a group, marked with the Jenkins build number so that I can walk back to Jenkins and say, hey, what were the changes that went into this build? So I know exactly who broke the build, and it's usually me, so I can blame myself. Um, last night I kept pushing something at like 1 a.m. here, and it wouldn't compile on Jenkins, and I swore it compiled on my machine, and finally got told to give up and go to sleep. Um, but the fact that it goes through Jenkins meant that I didn't merge stuff into master that just didn't compile. And as I said, the last working version being available as a hot square backup is probably my favorite thing. Because I did, I've done a lot of system administration, as I said. I've dealt with these problems a lot. And having this in a simple process where everything is just ready to go, and I can imagine too spinning up a new team within an organization means that they have access to all these tools. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. Another blurry picture of Azar. Um, it's, not it's not a terribly useful picture anyway, even if you're looking at it. Um, but you have a couple things like auto scaling groups. This is paired up with that other internal tool, Namir. And that you can see these things. But then at the top, you've got links to all these different services that we have access to. And as I said, Asgard is open source. Um, you can download this and use this. If you're using AWS Cloud for things, there are some really cool, useful tools, including things like managing active server groups that can be flipped on or off at will based on the information fed in. It should go without saying that good tests matter a lot. Tests are really, really, really important. And it's taken me a long time to come around to this, but it turns out that being woken up at 3am because you broke production kind of sucks. And so if you have tests that help understand especially things like regression tests. When I fix a bug, ideally I write a test that reproduces the bug, and then I fix the bug. So that if somebody changes something and recreates that bug, we have a test that fails. 
and ideally uh, mark those regression bugs with a ticket number because they're not very useful when you uh, break something and have no idea how you fixed it the first time. But this is even more important in that environment with immutable images because you don't even get to log into the production machine and fiddle with things until you get it to work. You have to reproduce it in dev, get a working build through the CI system and into production. And you rely a lot on that continuous integration system. I'll be honest, I wish there was a better system than Jenkins out there, um, but I've not seen something better. I used Bamboo once, it wasn't much better. Uh, no offense to anyone from Atlassian in the crowd, although I think I've complained quite a lot about Jira on Twitter, so maybe there is offense taken. We use Skulltest. Um, it's a great tool. Uh, Bill Manners, who's the main developer on Skulltest, is like incredibly responsive. He's careful. Every release he's done is dead on. I think you know he continues to improve it and get the right thing. Plus, he publishes Martin Odersky's programming and scholar book. I mean, that alone is a wonderful thing. Um, there's actually just been a bunch of major updates. We just moved to Scala Test 2.2, and I haven't been able to 2.0. Haven't been able to play with much, but I know if you're writing your own matchers, there's some big improvements there. Specs 2 is really awesome as well. Actually, for a long time, I was Specs 2 for everything I did, and I really like Specs 2. But Scala Test, I think, is caught up. There's even things in these test frameworks you can do things. If you're working concurrently, they both have matchers called eventually. So it's like you can have something that's going to be populated by a future and just say eventually it should be this and then continue to retry in the background. We are not going to use the Z word here. Actually, we are. By which I mean Scala Z. And this is something that's happened pretty recently. I avoided Scala Z for a long time. Part of it was I met Lars in Oslo in May and said, wow, he's an incredibly nice and reasonable guy. Maybe I should give this scholars that thing a shot. Uh, it wasn't just that, but it was, you know, it took sort of seeing problems and thinking about whether I was continuing to use, I think I fell into a trap where I was using the same tools for a long time without really looking at better ways to solve problems. And I started going down the road a few months ago of trying to solve certain problems in a better way and Scala's Ed inevitably crept in. So I'm not really going to go through sample code with Scala's Ed. Um, I'll do that some tomorrow if you guys want to come to my talk and go through that. But I'm going to give you a rough idea of what's good about it and what we're using it for, just to sort of see how it ties into these things, where a big part of what we're trying to do is build code that works and works reliably, but also feed better information to our UI developers. So as I said, I've been playing with Scala's Ed a lot. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. There's a lot of stuff in there that I can't even begin to understand. Um, and I feel very stupid most of the time when I use Scala's Ed, but I'm told that that gets better. <laughs> what, what actually really impresses me as well with Scala's Ed is from, you would expect it if you've ever seen the outside and this big sprawling code base that makes no sense. But generally, any given concept is grouped very neatly into a commented file. So there's, you know, this, class, this file does everything related to this concept. So you can pull something up and look at it very easily. And it's one of those projects where the source code tends to be useful. The bits that I have found the most useful, and these are the bits that I recommend everyone go and look at because they're really cool and they're not as hard to get into as you might think. Um, they are kind of a gateway drug, however, is validation and disjunction. And disjunction is this really useful and hard to describe backslash forward slash operator which there was long arguments in my office about how we were to refer to this thing before somebody just told me call it a disjunction. Um, because in Scala Z, it's actually either dot Scala in the source space, but Scala already has an either, if that's at all confusing. So we had some problems to solve. One of the things that I found as I worked with things is, because as I said, we're really building, we're building this application where the Scala is half of it. We're building these back-end REST services that interact with the database, interact with other systems. But then we've got a bunch of guys building a UI on top of that. And part of the problem is how do we provide clear information to the UI that it can use to provide errors or just in that development cycle? You've probably all been through that where you go back and forth with your UI team trying to fix and improve things. So I've kind of done this personal quest on how can I improve validating input, providing errors and responses to the UI team, 
that makes sense. Five hundreds and generic exceptions. It turns out UI people don't like those. It doesn't tell them a terrible lot of information. So you end up in a development cycle where they come to you and they say, hey, I had this problem. And then you as a back-end developer have to try to reproduce it because you've given them no useful information to know. And it may turn out that they sent you an invalid value for a field. So I was looking for better ways on how to send that in. So we want to really help developers help themselves. If an error occurred, was it because the API received invalid data? A common one is there's lots of numerically ID things like companies and people that get fed in. And it's valid input. You sent me a JSON object that had a long in there. But it may turn out that as we're going through processing that, that was a bad company ID. Or this user doesn't have access to that company. And so it's important to feed information back. And if multiple errors occur, it becomes an even more interesting question because accruing information about errors or deciding to stop can be complicated. So the two really nice things, that's one of the new points. Um, validation in non-empty list is really great for these are all the things that went wrong. Validation is Really, the place that I started, although it turns out that it's useful for some things and not useful for others, but Scala Z also has this non-empty list. So does anybody want to guess what the value of a non-empty list is versus just using a list? Anyone? The element on the list. Right, there's always at least one element. So when you're doing something like returning errors, a non-empty list is really useful for saying there's at least one error in here. And so non-empty list plays very nicely to the point that there's also a version of the validation object that's validation NEL that says that the error side of it will contain a non-empty list. And what's cool as well is the validation is applicative, so you can accrue many results of these validations together. So one of the things that I wrote recently was when we get input for a certain piece, there are all of these checks that we need to run. Did you give me a device name that's unique? Does this conform to a certain regular expression? Is this serial number unique? And all of these other things that we used to just run them. But it was hard to say, oh, well, we're going to run all of these things and then return a list of everything that went wrong. And instead, we would stop when we hit an error. And for some kinds of input, it helps to do everything and then return it. And so being able to accrue this was really useful. And as I said, using a non-empty list for failure means that one of the applicants allows you to add each together. So you can just say run all of these things and combine them. And if any of them is a failure, all of the failures will accrue into that list. And there's operators for doing cool things. It's incredibly big, I know. Isn't it exciting? Uh, it's something that Honestly, you probably could spend two hours in just a Scala's Ed talk looking at all of these things, but there's some very interesting operators. Um, also, it's fun to argue about what to call these obscure operators. Um, so right now, there's one that's pipe at pipe, and I think we're arguing over Cinnabon versus TIE Fighter. <laughs> um, and there's implicits to convert things. So one of the really cool things is that there are some nice implicits within Scala's Ed for converting options. We all we use a lot of options in Scala code um, to convert an option to something else so that you can use it for these other things or convert it either to something else. And so they're all there. The other piece is uh, disjunction, that V. It's a lot like Scala's either. It has a left and it has a right value. But Scala's either, you can't iterate over it. It's not a monad. I can't do put it in a for comprehension. So I have to explicitly say, are you left, are you right? It's essentially encouraged to use a big nasty match statement. This is, and I could be wrong in my terminology here. Um, don't blame any of the people who explained this to me because I probably got it wrong. Um, but my understanding is that the term here is that it's right biased. So think of option in Scala. If you all have option in your head and you're thinking about it, so option, on the base of it, has a get method, right? So if I have sum and I call get, I get an instance of t. 
If I call get on none, what happens? It throws an exception. But if I iterate over an option, so I have a for comprehension, and I say for x from something that's an option, if x is sum, ultimately I can yield sum. But if x is none, I exit back out with none. So that's the right bias where if you iterate over it, it tries to do things as long as there's a value. And so the benefit really of disjunction over either is that it has that same right bias. And I've been using that a lot instead of option because I can convert my options to a disjunction and say, hey, if it's none, the left side should be this error message. Instead of, so instead of returning, hey, I tried to get this company from the database, but it was none, and I might have five things chained up in a four, I can say, hey, this is exactly what went wrong. And there's, again, operators and implicits for excuse me, converting things like options in order to get more information. And this is something that's there's lots and lots to explore. There's actually a couple really good articles out there on validation versus disjunction. One thing I'll tell you is that it took a frustrating week for me to realize this. It used to be that validation in Scala Z was iterable as well. You could treat it like a monad. I believe the way it was described to me is that was a mistake and it was accidental. So you'll find lots of examples of people iterating over validation in Scala Z6 that don't work in Scala Z7. So basically, if you want to iterate, you've got to use disjunction. If you want to do things with accruing information, you use validation. And I know that's all very confusing, and I apologize. So questions? Yes? So the question is about whether database changes are immutable in the same way. I don't, there may be other tools within the organization. We are not using them right now. I would love to have something like that. I don't know how easy of a thing it is to do. So we typically have the challenge of um, remembering that once we've made a schema change in dev, to get it in the CI before the code gets pushed into the CI. So that's something that I don't, at least in front of me, the current tool set, have a solution to. But it is something that's important, and it, it, I would love to have a solution. So if you have a solution to it, please offer. Oh, I have just wondering. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think there's things out there. I mean, it's a hard problem to solve, because a lot of it ends up being, I think, backup driven a lot of times with databases. Because when, if you roll back a schema change, well, what do you do with all the extra column or information you get out of it? Clearly, the answer is you use a schemaless database. No, wait. Uh, for some problem, yes. Other questions? Yes. So, uh, this view created an AMI with mm -hmm. all the application code and everything. And then, oh, as soon as the machine boots, I believe the service goes up, right? Like, is that the way you do it? Or? Yeah, so it, it, there is essentially a template AMI which has the base, this is the Tomcat server or whatever else. These are all the services that need to be on this. And then Jenkins built a WAR file. That WAR file is then added onto the template server, baked and pushed out. I believe the templates changed to go along as well. There was a, there was a push for something, I think, around you know, a, a, a version change that we want to move to this version of something where we had to update our template base. But essentially, Jenkins is creating a WAR file. That WAR file is being baked onto a template AMI, and then that AMI is what we feed into the production system. Great. Thanks. Other questions? In the back there? Are you looking into using Docker images instead of uh, yeah. AMIs? Uh, you're asking about Docker versus AMIs? Yeah. Uh, that is not my department. I have no idea. It would be cool. But it's a whole other group that sets those things up and runs them. Anybody else? Have I confused you all that thoroughly? <laughs>
regarding releasing the production, um, do you push it to 100% of the uses or chunks and then go <coughs> gradually? For our product, because we have a smaller scope, our product, the product I work on faces our partners, people who are building Netflix devices, rather than customers. We roll everything out straight out. It's out, it's ready to go. It's also coordinated with the UI side of things, which is a separate product release. Um, I don't know what the story within the rest of the other, the rest of the organization would be, but I know there's been some um, good posts on our blog and other places about the AB tests that we do, which is out, sort of outside my area of expertise, and I would probably uh, say the wrong thing if I was to go into that. I know it's not a very helpful answer. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.